Hertfordshire. That's the campus in Hatfield by the A1, by the Galleria, you know. Um, I'm also the research champion and the vice president of this branch. And I'm actually here today speaking as the research champion about research that I've been lucky enough to learn about at two conferences I attended recently. Okay, should we have the next slide? But before getting on to the research, I'll say just a little bit more about myself. So, yes, my day job is as principal lecturer at the university, is actually teaching psychology students about the brain. I don't have Parkinson's myself, but I have been involved in Parkinson's research for many years. And my interests are quite broad, all the way from what's happening in the brain, particularly the dopamine neurons, the little brown things that look like tadpoles, that are so crucial in Parkinson's. So I'm interested in that sort of research, but also all the way to strategies to help people live well with Parkinson's. And that is things like dance for Parkinson's, exercise, music for Parkinson's, chair yoga, mindfulness, all those sort of things. So, as I said, it's really sort of quite broad interests. Um, nowadays, I tend not to do the research directly myself. I have wonderful collaborators that I'm sort of advising as a supervisor or just guiding. So the current research projects I'm involved with um, include Mahmoud Irabani and his wonderful group of students and postdocs in the pharmacology department at the University of Hertfordshire, and they're researching drugs that may help reduce dyskinesia in Parkinson's and that also may also protect neurons in the brain. I'm also involved in the Music for Movement and Mood project, the Songlines project with Dawn and Marietta. Um, some of you are probably involved in that. I don't know if anyone here is actually attending that at the moment, these sessions that are going on on Mondays. Some of you may be signed up to start in uh, through the autumn. There's another batch of sessions. This is helping people learn to use music to help you move. Okay. And then also the chair yoga and mindfulness work with uh, Liz Opperdyke and Becky Hadley. And as I put this slide together, I realised you've had talks with all of these people in the past year. So that's fantastic. I don't need to talk about those. But, so back in October, it was Will Powell talking about the work. This is in animal models of Parkinson's about these drugs protecting neurons in the brain. Uh, Marietta in January, I think it was, talking about the, the music project. And then just last month, Liz was here talking about the yoga. So I'm not talking about this research. I'm not talking about research I'm directly involved with at the moment. Um, Shall I move on, please, David, the next slide? So as research champion, I'm going to be talking about other research. Um, to say, what is a research champion? I was asked the other day, well, are you a champion of research or a champion for research? And I have to stop and think a minute to make sure I've got the words right. And the answer is, I'm not a champion of research. Nobody's given me a medal or an award or anything like that. It's not that. It's the other meaning, which is I am championing research, as in I am sort of helping people discover, learn about research. So in that sense, championing. So this is a, a role that, it's a volunteer role with Parkinson's UK, that ideally every branch has a research champion, whose role is, as it says, to connect the local community to research. So that's what I hope I'm doing today, okay? This is, this my role as research champion. Okay, thank you, David. Let's go on to the next slide. Yes, so these conferences, I called it Brighton to Barcelona because that was the location of the two conferences. Um, yes, so the first one was in Brighton, was the British Neuroscience Association. So this is a gathering of many of the neuroscientists working in the UK with some international speakers as well, but it's, it's largely sort of UK-based, probably the largest gathering of neuroscientists all together for a conference um, each year. Um, not all working on Parkinson's. The, the topics are really quite broad. It's a very broad conference normally. Sometimes there's only a few pieces about Parkinson's. But this year, Parkinson's UK sponsored the conference and the conference was organised so that there were what's called streams, sessions on Parkinson's. So there was actually a lot of research on Parkinson's 
And it was possible to select such that you were just going to things on Parkinson's. So that's why I went to that conference. That was very, very interesting. Um, some of it was recorded. It is available online, but you would have to register and sign up and pay for that. So not sure if that's worth doing now. These are talks given by experts in the field. It's not designed for the general public here, but if you are interested, I understand some of those talks are there. Okay, so that's one conference back in April in the conference centre by the beach, but unfortunately it was all rainy and cold, so it wasn't quite the beach. It's still a nice venue, but uh, it wasn't really a beach holiday, that one. <laughs> Shall we go on to the next one? Okay, this is in Barcelona. This was the World Parkinson's Congress, which took place just two weeks ago. So two weeks ago, I was down there in Barcelona. Nice weather, about 28 degrees, so I'm thankful that the conference was then and not now, because I might be absolutely boring now, because in Spain. Um, this was a fabulous conference. It's the first time I've been to one of these big World Parkinson's conferences, and it's wonderful. It's unique because the delegates are both people with Parkinson's. What's up there? Too close. Okay. People with Parkinson's and people with interest in general Parkinson's and with all the top researchers as well. It's the only conference where they all come together. And I say it's great. So and it was quite large, getting on for nearly 3,000 people from 73 countries. It really was international. Um, I think it's really good because the researchers get to talk with people with Parkinson's and sometimes researchers are stuck in their lab working their test tubes and their cell plates and they don't actually get to meet people with Parkinson's. So it's really good for that and people with Parkinson's will get up and ask the questions and there might be slightly different questions at the moment getting those researchers thinking. So I think that was really good. And obviously there's a lot of keen people who are really interested in research. So I say in that sense it was fabulous. It was organised so that the Turk talks were graded, sort of different streams. One was called basic science, which was the hardcore science. Then there was another stream which was called clinical science, which was more working with people with Parkinson's testing, drugs or different interventions. And then the third stream, um, comprehensive care, I think it was called. It was sort of the living well with Parkinson's sort of thing. So you could choose when he went to the sort of more hardcore science ones or the other. So it was really well organised and I recommend it to anybody who'd like to go. They're about every two or three years. Um, I heard on the great one, the next one might be in North America, Canada or Eastern United States, but in about two years, maybe three years. So I'm looking forward to going. Actually, this, this conference was delayed by a year because of COVID, which I think they're normally every three years, but I understand they're going to have it catch up and have it in two years. So I must say these two conferences were the first time I've been to a conference in person for three years because of COVID. So that was also great to actually talk to people in person. So strongly recommend that one, you know, another year. And I know there were people I know from this area with Parkinson's who went. So it was great to meet them there. Okay, should we go on to the next slide? Yes, so what am I going to talk about today? So there was so much in these two conferences, I can't possibly cover it all. Um, so I've picked four sort of topics that interested me. If you had a different speaker who'd been to the same conferences, they might have chosen many other different topics. So this is just my sort of personal selection. I hope I've chosen ones that interest you. So I'm going to be talking about these four topics, a biomarker for Parkinson's, then about brain first or body first, where does Parkinson's start? Then about, is it useful to track Parkinson's symptoms? And then about a drug that's actually useful, it looks like, for treating dyskinesias. Next one, David, is um, just end on something slightly lighter. Also, I talked looking at a comedy in Parkinson's by a true comedian who has Parkinson's. That was a wonderful way to round off the uh, Barcelona conference. And then finally about opportunities for you to keep learning about research and shaping research and taking part in research. So that's where I'm going with this talk. Thank you, David. So next one. Right, so let's start with the first topic. So this is the biomarker for Parkinson's. And I wonder if any of you heard about this at the time, because it sort of made the news and quite a splash. It was released in April, just before I went to the Brighton conference. So everybody at Brighton was talking about this. But certainly Michael J. Fox made a big thing about it because Michael J. Fox Foundation had put a lot of money into this. 
but also lots of other organizations and interestingly drug companies and other companies into this project because it's so useful, would be so useful to have a biomarker for Parkinson's. That's something biological you can measure that tells you whether you've got Parkinson's. Okay. And certainly Michael J. Fox came out and gave interviews and webinars and whatever about this saying how important it was, landmark study and so on, and talking about it and deeply moved by breakthrough and so on. So I'm th I think that this is probably the most important research being published of the year, or certainly so far, certainly a lot of interest in it. So I thought I'd spend a little bit of time just talking through what it involves. If we go on to the next slide. So this is the actual publication. I'm just going to talk through what the researchers actually presented. So this is from the actual article there, published in Lancet Neurology. It's got a really long title, but I hope I'll have unpacked that by the time we finish as to what it means. So first of all, what is a biomarker? Well, an objective way of detecting and potentially tracking the biological processes underlying Parkinson's. I say, we haven't really got this. Researchers haven't got a way of, of actually taking some biological sample and saying that person's got Parkinson's or not. The closest is probably going for a brain scan and measuring dopamine levels, but even that's not, you, know, you may have had that, but even that's not necessarily telling you everything. Sometimes you can have people who've got Parkinson's symptoms and, and yet the dopamine levels still begin to be fairly high, okay. So it, it's not in itself a great biomarker. Of course, having a brain scan is quite a big thing to have done and expensive. So having some sort of biological sample would be a great deal easier and cheaper. So that's the objective. Next one, David. So the marker that this study looked at is the protein called alpha-synuclein, which if you're interested in Parkinson's research, you may well have heard about. This is the protein that builds up in the brain, and clogs up the brain, and it, it spreads through the brain as well. It sort of gets misfolded, and that triggers misfolding of other synuclein molecules, and it, this is why it spreads, and eventually we think that's the key to causing the damage. Now, this study it didn't take biopsies directly from the brain, just wouldn't want to do that. But it did have samples, new samples taken from lumbar punctures. So that's where the needle is inserted between the bones and the spinal cord and little bits of fluid removed from, from there, from in this sort of gap in the, in the middle of the spinal cord. This is called cerebrospinal fluid. And this is the fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. So it's a way of finding out what might be happening in the brain. So that's what they measured. So it is actually a marker of the build-up of this protein, which we think is so closely associated with Parkinson's. Okay. It still remains the case, I'd say, that Parkinson's is diagnosed chemically by a doctor based on symptoms, actually. But I say this is looking for, is there a biological way we can detect what's going on? So it's actually, technically, it's a biomarker for the synuclein, I would say. Yes, David, next. Thank you. So the technique they use, this is one of the long words in the title, this seed amplification, how they did this um, is from that CSF sample, which was quite small, and probably only has tiny, tiny amounts of uh, synuclein. And they took that and put it in some sort of test tube container that had a lot of normal synuclein. A bit from the sample, if it was misfolded synuclein, that would cause the synuclein in the sample to misfold as well. Okay, it works like it's it's like if anyone's familiar really with prion diseases, like scrapie and like cow diseases. A misfolded protein can cause another protein of that type to misfold and so it builds up. So they're using that in the test tube to sort of amplify the amount of synuclein there is this small misfolded synuclein. What they'd actually do is leave it there for half an hour to build up, then shake it about to break up the clumps, and then the separate clumps would then attach to other bits, more bits of synuclein, and they would misfold and so on, and it would grow. So this is the amplification. So it starts from a tiny, tiny amount of misfolded synuclein and builds up to something you can actually measure. And it also involves attaching a chemical with a fluorescent colour light to it that you can see down the microscope. So that's how they're actually measuring this. So that's what this means, the seed amplification assay and why it's 
involving synuclein and actually measuring synuclein. Okay, I should have said, if you've got any questions as I'm going along, or want me to slow down or explain a bit again, do say, because I can go over bits again. Okay. Yes. Uh, how, how do you actually make the measurement? Because if you start off with a, an original concentration, yeah. Yes, yes. How do you measure the significance? I should explain, it's like a yes-no answer on this. It's at the minute, it doesn't grade how much. It simply is there misfolgocynuclein or not. What they actually did is measured it in three different little wells. If it came up positive in two of the in all three, that was a positive finding. Two out of three, they'd look again. One out of three, they'd say no. So it's a yes, no. Whereas I think your question would be, well, what if you were trying to quantify it? So it's not quantifying it at the moment. Just a yes, no. Yeah. Okay, so this study was done by, what's remarkable about this study, because that, that technique of seed amplification had been done before in people with Parkinson's, but relatively small numbers, just to show the method work. What was new and exciting about this study was the number of participants, over a thousand, over 500 people with Parkinson's, groups of people who didn't have Parkinson's, people who were at risk of Parkinson's, so they didn't have Parkinson's, but they did have smell loss or they did have a sleep disorder, both of which put you at risk of Parkinson's. And then 300 people with a genetic mutation that puts you at risk of Parkinson's as well. So it's huge. Now, how on earth could they gather so many samples? Obviously, you can't do that quickly. It actually takes a long time. We have the next bit. So it actually took over 10 years to collect these samples from that number of participants. Remember, these are all volunteers who are doing it for the benefit of research, not for themselves, because it's not immediately leading to some sort of new treatment. It's not even testing a new treatment. It's just gathering all the samples and putting them in storage for something that might be useful in the future. Okay, because 10 years ago, they didn't know about the seed amplification. So this depended on amazing volunteers who had volunteered to have things like brain scans and lumbar punctures for the purpose of collecting all this data to be used in the future. This is called the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. This large group of people who have given these samples, and that's what this study used. Okay. Um, okay, David, yes, thanks. Okay, so what did they find? Well, in the people with Parkinson's, they found that nearly 98%, some 87% of people had positive samples. So people here who had got a diagnosis of Parkinson's very high percentage did have this misfolded synuclein. So that high number is actually as, as good as, as biomark, it's very good. It's saying it's a very sensitive test for detecting that. So that's sort of confirming, these people already had a diagnosis of Parkinson's, so this is sort of adding to that confirming, and yes, you've got this alpha synuclein problem as well. Okay, what was also interesting is if, the, if those people with Parkinson's had also lost their sense of smell, it went up to 90, 98%, absolutely huge. So a combination of Parkinson's and a loss of smell, it's very likely you've got this buildup of alpha synuclein. And conversely, it's very useful then that this test could be used as a, as a marker of Parkinson's. Okay, so the test is sensitive, so it's picking up people very well with the sign of gene, but actually that's not used if it's too sensitive, if it's picking it up in people who don't have Parkinson's. So the other good thing about this study is that in the healthy controls who didn't have Parkinson's, 96% had a negative result. So not only is the test very sensitive, picking up, yes, there is a problem with the sign of gene in the people who have Parkinson's, it's also very specific as it's finding negatives that people who don't have Parkinson's don't have this. Okay, so you need both for a good test. So that's important. Thank you, David. Yes, so it's as I said, it's a very sensitive for detecting this misfolded synuclein if you have Parkinson's, and very specific since it does not detect a misfolded alpha synuclein if you don't have Parkinson's. And that's what makes it useful as a biomarker. Any questions so far? Why do you think they had a difference between if you just had smell loss and there's quite a big difference? 
I think it will come to that. It's probably where the Parkinson starts in the brain. And that's the second topic that I think sort of fits with this. Um, it, it may be to do with Parkinson's starting in the brain in those people, other people starting in the gut. Yeah, that's a great question. Should we go on to the next slide? Okay, so what about this? Some other really interesting things about this study. The people who had genetic uh, mutations that put them at risk of Parkinson's, David, could we keep going next, please? Um, click again. Uh, yes, GBA. I can't remember what this stands for now. Uh, I that. Anyway, one of these mutations that put you at risk of Parkinson's, um, with these people, 95.9% had the misfolded nucleus. So that's telling us that if you have that mutation, the mechanism almost certainly involves the buildup of synuclein. Okay. Um, because that's a really high number. Next slide. What's interesting, though, is there's a different mutation, and this is one of the more common mutations called LERP2, which puts you at risk of Parkinson's. Um, but the numbers were slightly lower in these people. 89% uh, still quite high. But interestingly, people who didn't have smell loss, it went right down to 34.7%. Still not quite sure from what this means. I think it's really interesting finding that people will be discussing quite what does this mean. Um, it, it does suggest that the sort of one that just simply to say that this group of people is something slightly different. Um, we know Parkinson's is not a single condition. People talk about it as a spectrum. We know it's quite varied. People have different symptoms. Uh, and this is picking up something different here. I think that I'm sure will be explored in future studies and work out what's going on. I think not having the smell loss probably means the Parkinson's didn't start in the brain and it's the brain's cerebrospinal fluid that, that has the CSF, the, the synuclein that's being measured here. So maybe it's, it's a different type of Parkinson's. So it's telling us there are sort of subgroups. Okay, David, if we go on. And um, this was also very, very interesting. What about the people who are at risk of Parkinson's? So this study had 51 people, I think, who did not have Parkinson's, but they did have either smell loss or they had a sleep disturbance, say, which particularly with the sleep disturbance is quite high risk of leading on to Parkinson's. These people had an 86% positive samples here. So even though they didn't have Parkinson's yet, it was picking up that there was something wrong with the protein. Yes, the question over there. Could you explain what you mean by a sleep disorder? Because yes. Maybe some people, maybe take myself as an example, who has never been a good sleeper, does that, you know, never sleep? Okay, this is what I'm not a clinician or a researcher in sleep disorders, no. so my understanding is it wouldn't be just that you're a poor sleeper, but it might depend why you're a poor sleeper. It's mm, to do with the control of sleep, which is obviously controlled by brain areas that it's not switching your brain on and off, it's actually switching between different states. Yes, like Obviously when you're dreaming that's a different state to when you're in deep sleep and that's a different state to when you're awake. Yeah. So the various mechanisms control that, but some sleep disorders you can have when you're effectively dreaming while you're awake or not switching off your body properly when you're asleep, it, it gets disorganised. Yeah. Um, saying you know, if you, the, the, the REM sort of happens at about after about three or four hours, and I never yes. get to that, for Oh, right, so okay. Okay, I don't know enough specifics about whether that would count here. Um, I do need to know the other study I'm going to talk about next, about how they measured sleep disorders, which does involve videos and putting lots of sensors on people to detect micro-movements while they're asleep. Okay, yeah. There was another question. You, you distinguish between those who have Parkinson's and those who don't. Yes. How do you know when they have it and when they don't have it? This is based on the clinical diagnosis by a neurologist. So you might have now, it before you're diagnosed. Yes. Yes, so in these people, that is a possibility. And of course, the diagnosis of Parkinson's, how accurate is that? It's not always 100% accurate. Sometimes the doctor may say, you think you've got Parkinson's, and then a few years later it turns out you've got something else. Or the other way around, I think you've got a central tremor, and then it turns out it's Parkinson's. So the clinical diagnosis is, yeah, is not always 100% accurate. 
in the best world, neurologists are experts, it's difficult. Um, which is another reason why a biomarker would be useful that adds to the evidence of whether it's likely to be Parkinson's or not. That makes sense. Yes. There's also a DAT scan. Yes, yes. So that's the DAT scan is the one that measures the dopamine loss. Yes, and that, that's also a good indicator and it, it suggests that you've got your Parkinson's symptoms are due to loss of dopamine. But there are some individuals who have good DAT on the DAT scans, they've still got dopamine there, and yet they still appear to have Parkinson's. So it's not, again, 100%. So I think another marker here is useful. Anyway, this is the finding that I think excited an awful lot of interest, because potentially this is then being able to find people who are at high risk of Parkinson's because they have this misfortune, <laughs> and this is before they've been diagnosed. So if one was, say, designing a treatment that worked with that they really needed to be given very very early before the diagnosis because often people have symptoms of building up associated with Parkinson's over some years beforehand this would be very useful so this is another reason why this study was seen to be really important the possibility of a biomarker that would detect somebody who may well go on to have Parkinson's before they've actually been diagnosed yes so, so if you just doing the at-risk people mm. Earlier, could do. Or, or would you screen the whole population? Oh, well, that's a question I think for economists, really, isn't it? Health economists, is it what is it worth doing? And it also depends on is there a treatment that we know that's going to work? And at the minute, we've got some drugs that have potential and exercise has potential, but is that really strong enough, all of that, to say? So I think it's something that's going to change over the next few years, probably, and maybe we will move to that. Uh, and now it seems more worthwhile looking for those treatments as well, yes. actually. So it's sort of combined there. But in the end, it is, you know, it's nice in this country who do know that sort of economic judgment. Is it worth doing all the tests to actually offer, you know, to people? Yeah. Yes, thank you, David. Let's go on there. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, that was a key point there and why there was a lot of interest, a lot of interest in this study here it may be useful to select people for early treatments before Parkinson's is diagnosed. Okay, let's go on to the next slide here. Okay, one thing I really liked about the World Parkinson's Congress, you remember half the participants nearly have got Parkinson's, is someone would stay up, stand at me and say, well, what does this mean for me? <laughs> it's a great question for research scientists often, because sometimes they talk about the research, it's like, well, what's this going to mean for me? So if we go on and just think about that, there's bits of discussion about that conferences so the next one coming up there okay I think I've already mentioned if, if you now this is not available yet okay this is a new discovery but I can see this coming down the road in a few years maybe if you go to a doctor and they suspect Parkinson's but they're not sure this could be a test that then is useful to find out, in effect, whether you've got that misfolded protein that is going to cause, you know, seem to underline uh, Parkinson's. Is it, is, it not, sorry, is it not too late then for the early treatment? Well, we don't know. I mean, that's still earlier possibly than yeah. currently. <laughs> Quicker diagnosis, maybe. Um, I would say there was a bit of discussion about some comfort. But it's, I think the answer, if you've already got Parkinson's and had it for some years, it's not so useful for you at this point. There's no point rushing to your doctor now and saying, can I have this test? Because it's really not going to tell us anything new. No. So it's more for people where it's not sure if they've got Parkinson's. But by the time you're diagnosed, you're, what's it, 80% of your cells? And yes, cells yeah. so yeah. the earlier the better. Yeah. yeah. Which is why this looks promising. It's earlier than has been possible before. Should we go on to the next one? So, um, so it adds to the evidence of Parkinson's subtypes. And if you remember back to the, oh, it's up there, the title, the heterogeneity in Parkinson's. You know, people have different symptoms, and um, particularly as Parkinson's develops and people have different sets of associated symptoms that we know are like constipation and the sleep storm that we mentioned, the loss of smell, the sort of associated with Parkinson's, um, and yet end up with sort of similarish motor symptoms, or they can differ as well, actually. So it's really quite variable, and it's not been well understood why, but this adds to the evidence that there are Parkinson's subtypes. I mean, there's a lot more detail in this article than I've talked about here, because I think it took me a long while to, 
decipher it all. Um, but the one I showed you about the people that like two mutation being different from the others, it's more like biological evidence. Yes, there is something different going on here, even if we don't fully understand what. Should we go on, David? Is that good? No. no, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah, we've mentioned this already. Identify people at risk and start preventative treatments when there's available. Let's go on to the next one. David talked about that. And importantly, I think this will have a more immediate impact, which is selecting participants for clinical trials to ensure the proposed treatment is appropriate for the type of Parkinson's. So, for example, say you're developing a treatment that involved trying to get rid of the synuclein, of folded, then it would be best for your study to make sure that the person, people you're recruiting have that misfolded synuclein, and it's not worth pe taking people who don't. Okay, or it, it may be some other measure. Um, I have heard of comments from people with Parkinson's being frustrated they were not allowed to take part in the study because they didn't meet the criteria. I'd ask you to look at it the other way around and say, well, you're wasting your time if you volunteer to take part in this study, but from what we know about your profile, it's unlikely you'll benefit from that proposed treatment. So think of it as a benefit, I'd suggest, of being able to select the appropriate people. So for this subtype of Parkinson's, with this treatment may be very useful, so let's test it in those people. Okay, and then for another group of people, it's gonna be a different sort of treatment. So. And I think some trials are already doing this, but taking more attention to perhaps in the past about selecting based on subtype. And this will be an important marker to enable people to do that, I think. So this is going to have a more immediate impact. So just looking overall on the impacts for people, those are my points on that. Better than to select people within the, when the problems is in the family, in the genetic. But for certain studies, yes, yes, yes. And I know there have been calls on through the Parkinson's UK research, volunteering yes. for research, they've been looking for particular subtypes. That's right. Yes. Because when you've got a particular gene mutation and the researchers think they know what that means and what processes in the body brain are affecting, they're targeting those particular processes. Yes, you want to test it in people with that mutation, but there's no point testing it in other people who don't have Parkinson's but don't have that mutation. Yes. Would be better to focus on the ones. Yes, better to focus on the ones we do. So this helps with the focusing, I think, of selecting people. So I think this will be quite a big impact and, and generally adds to this better understanding of there are subtypes and taking them more seriously perhaps. Okay, next David. And just finally here to make the point, this is only possible because nearly a thousand people volunteered to give their samples, and that included blood, CSF, brain scans, lots of tests um, for the sake of research, for future use, even not going to an immediate trial, that, that particular cohort. Um, so that's really necessary to take this research forward. But unfortunately, it takes a long time. This is like over 10 years um, that these sort of studies are needed. So, yes. What did you call it? The um Ace Alpha is, is, is alpha. that symbol is alpha, alpha synuclein. Yeah. It's protein. Um, at what stage can you, you know, if you, if, if you have Parkinson's, at what stage is it useful to have the next generation <coughs> tested for this, this um, uh, protein to, to see whether they are going to be likely to have it if it's going to not fold or fold? Okay, so. We need to learn a bit more about it to be able to answer specifically when. We just talked about how um, ideally the sooner the better. Say there's some at-risk symptom, then it, it would be useful to take it. There's some uncertainties in that. I, I mentioned it briefly about, and we'll come on to where Parkinson's starts. It might be there's differences between the groups. If it starts in the brain, you're more likely to pick up this than if it starts in the gut. So that and yet you're both going to end up with Parkinson's. So there's some uncertainties just at the moment. Yeah. Yes? Um, I would say possibly, certainly it would be more important to test for GBA variants in your children, your grandchildren, if well, you have it. Yes. Because that would be yes. the case. People at this, yes. If both parents have it, they're very high chance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's work that's going on with uh, uh, West Andrew Shapiro. Right. At uh, World Free. Yeah. The Rhapsody project that we've, we've been part of for a long time. Great, yes. Um, and that is, that's a really important one. 
So it's another other of the Sanitia is a bit more to tell you. Certainly GBA, the variant of the GBA are one key. Yeah, so this GBA, so I didn't put the variant name up there. It was a particular variant that I can't remember because there are different variants, so they were looking at a particular one. But this study tells us it's a very high proportion of people who have that variant who do have the dysphagia So it's telling us that is probably part of the mechanism in those people. Whereas the people who've got the LARC2, it might be slightly different mechanisms involved. Yeah, so a lot there. There's, there's more on the genetics in the paper that I didn't. It's getting a bit complicated to <laughs> talk about, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so that's that big important study that I've gone into quite a bit of detail because I think it's quite an important one and lots of sort of discussion issues. Okay, should we go on? Okay, so this is the next topic that grabbed my attention and actually is related to what we've just been talking about, about subtypes of Parkinson's. And this is a talk by Per Borghammer. Um, who's based in Arbus in Denmark, but it involves wider groups of people as well. Um, and it was in the session focusing, there were several talks on the question of do biological subtypes of Parkinson's exist? Okay, so we know that the profile of symptoms differs quite a lot among people with Parkinson's, but what's the biological basis of that? Can we identify biological subtypes? Okay, I thought the easiest way to do this was to put up the diagram and talk through that. There was a lot of evidence in the paper that this came from, I can't talk about all of it, but just to get the general idea across and some of the key evidence. Okay, so I think you may well have come across the idea that Parkinson's may start in the gut. So the gut, you know, the stomach, and so they have called the enteric nervous system. There are a lot of nerves down there that we're not really aware of. Um, but the idea came from work by, quite well known work now by Barack, who found sort of evidence of this synuclein misfolding in the gut and at different stages the evidence that it sort of moved up through the nerves, particularly the vagus nerve, until it got to the brain. So the idea of it spreading from the gut. So that idea has been around for a while. But there's also evidence that suggests well Parkinson starts in the brain, start in the brain, particularly in regions called the limbic system and the olfactory tubercles. And the idea it may come in somehow um, to that part of the brain first and spread from there. So this study showed evidence that there's both going, that some people, evidence it starts in the gut, another group of people it starts in the brain, um, about equal numbers actually. I think if they included the gut, some people where this type of problem starts in the gut end up not with Parkinson's but with dementia with Lewy bodies, which is a bit in some ways related, involves synuclein. Okay, so to talk you through the diagram, you see the numbers there, that's the order that things happen. So if we look first at the one on the left, that's body uh, first Parkinson's, the number one is the idea of the original problems in the gut. Perhaps some inflammation there, some sort of problem, and the synuclein gets misfolded for some chance reason. And then that spreads up through various nerves in your body, including the, the long orange one, I think there's the vagus nerve, until it reaches parts of the brain. Um, and also the heart. The heart's important in this story. The heart's got innervated by nerves, of course. And um, synuclein misfolding happens there as well. Can be problems there. Uh, and it moves up through the brain until it gets to critically these areas in the sort of the base of the brain, an area called the pons and the locus cerealis here, number three there, and these are the brain areas involved in controlling sleep that we were just talking about, where well, these different mechanisms for coordinating the rest of your brain, whether it's in a sleep state or awake state or a dreaming state, a lot of that is controlled in that part of the brain, so when there's damage in that region, that's when people can be having sleep disorders. But that is not quite as high up in the brain as the dopamine neurons are. So the dopamine neurons are at number four in the substantia nigra. So it wouldn't be until those neurons are damaged that someone will get the symptoms of Parkinson's. Okay, but all these other symptoms would happen first for a gut one. So starting off, say, with constipation problems, uh, sleep disorder problems before the Parkinson's, eventually happens and then affecting the rest of the brain. 
Okay, so that's sort of an explanation for why the symptoms might happen in that order and why someone might start with constipation problems 10, 20 years before getting Parkinson's. Okay. On the other side, we've got, yes. Maybe I misunderstood this, but I understood that nerves transfer electrical signals. They do, yes. Not, yes. not uh, chemicals. Okay, so yes, you're absolutely right. They, their normal function is that they're transmitting electrical signals through long distances. And at the end, they release, so the little gap between one nerve at the next, and then they release a chemical, these neurotransmitters, and that then activates the next neuron to send its electrical signal. So that's its normal function. This synuclein is based around the synapses in the gap there, and it's there in all of us, and all our synapses have it, but it, when it gets misfolded, it sort of triggers misfolding of synuclein in the next neuron, and so it passes on. So it's both things are going on, but the electrical signal is going through our body, and that there, milliseconds, they're very, very quick. This synuclein spread is taking years. Where one bit is, is problem in one area is triggering it in the next area and so on. So it's a really slow spread. Okay, if you look at the other side, the brain first side, what's here is we think that the Parkinson's problem is this alpha-synuclein. For some reason, probably in the olfactory cortex, that's dealing with smell. So an early sign would be loss of smell, and it's spreading through the brain, but it's going downwards. So the first thing would be the loss of smell, and then the Parkinson's from the loss of dopamine, but that would happen before the sleep disorders and eventual gut problems. So over a long period of time, people with Parkinson's might end up with similar symptoms, but the order that they happen is different. So that's what this study looked at, and it did lots of measures. Uh, I just put the definition there, RBD, that means a REM sleep disorder. That's REM sleep is dreaming sleep. Okay. So they measured in a person all these different stages. They even had a way of measuring the size of your gut, the colon, and, and how long it took for stuff to go through your, your insides there. Um, they measured the heart, um, I can't remember what MINB stands for, but it's actually looking at the nerve innovation of the heart. And they also measured the REM sleep disorders using, as I was trying to describe, it um, sounds like complicated, but sort of video recordings of, of lots of measures of muscles and so on while the person's asleep, so really a proper measure of a sleep disorder. Then of course Parkinson's, and they did take um, measures of dopamine levels with those DAT scans as well. Okay, so they've got all this information for everybody. If we just click on next, David, what they found is that there's a group of people uh, who have Parkinson's. So one group of people they looked at had Parkinson's and had the sleep disorder. If we click again. Yes, it did. It's little things come up. On, on the other side, there's a group of people with Parkinson's who don't have a the sleep disorder, and then click again, there's a third group of people they looked at who just have a sleep disorder but don't have Parkinson's. They might well develop Parkinson's in a few years, but at this point they haven't got it. So it's three groups of people they compared. They were particularly focusing on the different combination of things going on. And what they found was there was a group of people who had the sleep disorder, and they would also have the loss of innovation of the heart. Um, and the sleep disorder, but they wouldn't have necessarily, oh, well, certainly in the, in the group who didn't have Parkinson's yet, they wouldn't have the dopamine loss. Um, whereas in the other group, who didn't have the sleep disorder problems and they had loss of smell, the heart was fine. Okay, and the gut problems weren't this, they weren't the gut problems. So it's, it's a way of separating out the groups of people. If we just go on to the next slide, I've got an example here of the sort of things they were measuring. So we're looking at Individual cases here, if we click again, David, actually the next, we'll do it twice, actually, there's a case one on the left, at the top we're seeing their brain scan and the scan of their body. Um, so at the top we're looking at down on the brain, section through like this, the, the, the yellow and red bits are where the dopamine is, measured by the DAT scan, uh, and this is somebody who's got a sleep disorder but hasn't, hasn't got Parkinson's yet, and the dopamine's fine. But now this is a bit tricky to look at this scan. If you imagine if you're looking at the abdomen from around here, well, I think the dark big thing is the liver. But what we're looking at is on the other side is where the heart should is. But on this person on the left, it's not whatever measure they're using here of nerves going to the heart, they're not 
they're damaged. They're not, they're not picking up the signal. If you compare that with the other side, David, if you just click again, please, case two, can you see the difference here? There's um, the heart. It's just, just up there. Yeah. So that person's still got intact nerve innovation to the heart. Um, and they don't have the sleep disorder. I thought it was really interesting that their dopamine loss was on one side and not the other. And of course, that's quite typical. Many people with Parkinson's is the problems start on one side before they go to the other side. And that is partly because of the Parkinson's, the, the damage is starting on one side and spreading on that side of the brain before it reaches the other side. Because the two sides of our brain at the front are actually fairly separate. We've got two hemispheres. They are connected, but they're still pretty separate. So it takes a while for problems to spread from one side to the other. So I thought that was quite interesting. It's picked up here. So unilateral Parkinsonism here, they say in this, this article, they argue it's more likely to be starting in the brain, whereas if it starts in the gut, it reaches the both sides about the same time. Yes? Um, I've never heard of heart innovation being an issue in Parkinson's before. So it's yeah. a bit worrying. Okay. <laughs> This is why I'm a bit ignorant on the clinical side of what the implications are of that. Do you say, if none of you have got that, it's not so a problem. Here it's, uh, maybe, I'm not quite sure what it's measuring here. It's measuring some change there in, in the nerves there. It's not necessarily saying it's preventing them from working, but it is picking up something. Okay, I need to look into more quite what it's, what it's measuring. There's a cardiogastric okay. thing, isn't there? So that when you eat, it can affect your heart. Oh right, okay. Well, the vagus nerve is connected to both. Yeah. So, so if you eat something well. that doesn't agree with you, it sets the heart. Yes. It well, it's all the system, isn't it? Your yeah, your autonomic nervous system. Can here. you have a mixture of both? Of what? Of body and brain? Well, I suppose yes. If you're unlucky and it starts in two places, but what they're saying here is that we can better understand. The different groupings of symptoms of people, particularly early stages of Parkinson's or even before they got Parkinson's, by doing this measuring of different things going on to get a profile and having a better understanding of where the Parkinson's problems might start. Okay, I thought this was a big theme in both conferences, a lot more attention to subtypes of Parkinson's and having to take more attention to that. Whereas in the past, many studies just sort of lumped everybody together didn't really take much notice of the differences, whereas now I think we really do have to. I just I thought this was interesting, particularly the unilateral part of the, the arguments here. So there's quite a number of different articles here I was looking up about this. There's quite a lot in this. But I hope I've got the flavour of it across the, the main idea. Should yeah. some, some people PD sort of early on they have problems with swallowing. And I, mm. and now I know when they sort of have full blown PD there probably yes. but I've heard that some people go for years with swallowing problems and it's not diagnosed as Parkinson's. Right. Does that have any impact on me? Well, I'm guessing here, but I predict they're the people in the body first group. Right. And it's maybe hit those parts of the brain involved in swallowing before it reaches the dopamine neurons, possibly. Um, yeah, the other thing I know is that one of the previous biomarkers is taking samples from the submaxillary glands up here. But that's a very unpleasant, that's not something you'd really want to do, but that they don't have found synuclein in those, misfolded synuclein in those glands. So it certainly can go up that way, yeah. So I think there's an awful lot of questions here to be explored in future research in detail, but at least we've got an idea of what yeah, might be going on. Then they can look for yes, them. yeah. Okay, shall we move on again? Something perhaps a little bit lighter. Okay, why should we track Parkinson's? Now this is a talk by Bastian Bloom, who you may have come across. He's the exercise expert. And you can't miss him at the conference, he's like six foot seven tall. <laughs> but he's, he's the you know, expert on exercise for Parkinson's. Um, but he was talking about tracking Parkinson's, and he, I mean tracking the symptoms rather than, you know, from behavior rather than biological markers. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting discussion here. Guy raised some really interesting points. Um, he's a clinician, he sees people in the clinic. He told a wonderful story about how people are sitting there waiting for his clinic. He peeps around the door and he sees them sitting there, possibly stressed from having to come from the car park and all that going on. Some of them practicing their tests that they're going to do for him. And he's thinking, this is not what I want. To, this is not a real 
useful snapshot of what is actually going on day to day for that person. So we did make quite a good case of what they see in the clinic, perhaps once a year, is not really a great way of really finding out what's going on. How useful it would be therefore to have tracking, to have measure what's going on over longer periods when the person's at home to get a better idea of what's going on. So he's arguing we need more objective measures to track symptoms over longer periods. Okay, shall we, next one, David? Okay. So he discussed various wearable devices, including an Apple smartwatch that's been um, released recently. So these are things you can wear, say, on your wrist. Um, and it's sort of tracking your movements in quite detail. Okay. Um, recently been approved, this is in the US, by the, the FDA for use, this device. Uh, I just thought he's, he's a clever but he's very funny actually because Apple Smartwatch and the title of the article he wrote about it was an apple a day to keep the Parkinson's doctor away. Okay, good joke there. Anyway, so he was discussing the use of these devices. He wasn't particularly saying one's better than the other at this point. And it's not the only one available, but he was making the case that actually we can learn a lot from these. And he did show various bits of evidence from studies he's done in this group and other groups. Um, showing that the measures are more re reliable in the long term. So with the, even with a smartwatch, so in the clinic he got a measure on the day that the person was in the clinic, but if you then looked at that person's measures over some weeks at home, you could see it was quite different. Okay. And, and nowadays they are quite detailed, so uh, lots of things you can measure, and particularly good for measuring sleep actually as well. Um, and he made the case this is more objective than this UPDRS. This is the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, which if you've ever been in a study, <laughs> I'm sure you will have done where the, the, um, the, the clinician there is rating you on lots of different various measures. And it is used in most studies, in all studies, Parkinson's as, as what are the symptoms like here. He's arguing that's not entirely reliable. And this, these actually ultimately would be better measures these objective measures. So it's quite interesting, so more discussion than research as such, but he did have some interesting research findings about arguing for the benefits of these um, being useful. So I think there'll be more and more, and again, if you, if, you, if you take part in the study now, I think it's highly likely you'll be asked to wear one of these things. I wonder how sensitive they are, because if I'm holding my phone, mm. it comes up and says, are you driving? Right. Yeah. Well, I think this is where the studies are going on now, and some of the publications there are reporting back. They need to do all the studies to find out how sensitive they are, and to match them against the UPDRS and see, or not. He's arguing we shouldn't even do that, but uh, but certainly to find out how detailed they are and, and what they're actually measuring. Yeah, I think that will be coming in more and more. Should we go on to the next one? Okay, this was in the same session. I thought this was wonderful, this lady. She has Parkinson's herself. She was diagnosed at a very young age. She's also a researcher. So she was there talking about research um, with herself as, well, she was researching into people self-tracking themselves. You see what I mean, including herself, presumably, but also investigating the benefits of people with Parkinson's tracking themselves, their symptoms. So I just was reading that, and it was just so fitted with the conference with this people with Parkinson's equal with the researchers, you know, up there on the, the podium and speaking, we have sessions both, but it's it just fitted in really nicely, I think. Um, and she's done a PhD on this, investigating the sort of the pros and cons of self-tracking your symptoms. I think any of you I've tried or, or do that, but just some of the arguments she said about, uh, should we go on to the next one, David? Um, she found the benefits, you now a deeper understanding of your own Parkinson's, what's going on. Um, more active communication with healthcare providers. They say, rather than you turn up to the doctors and they say, how are you? I say, fine, thanks. Or, or, or you base what you say on what happened in the last few days. If you're self-trapped, you've got some, some sort of record that maybe helps you remember what's been going on better, uh, and therefore leading to more better decisions about your care. So she was saying that's the benefits of people tracking themselves, but she did point out it's a lot of work <laughs> doing it. 
So it's sort of a trade-off here. So it's not saying everybody should be rushing out and doing it. It's maybe something you want to think about. Um, and maybe just doing it the two weeks before you go and see a doc or whatever might be useful. But I, I just thought it was a great thing. Sorry? So would you get the same with your video? Or just capture some footage? I don't know. I think she was thinking more like a diary. And what she showed us that she'd done, just rating like how she felt each day. On, or maybe on the couple of how she was on things like more like a little chart. But it, it wasn't necessarily videos. Um, but I don't know, she may have looked into that as well. I haven't read all of the things she's written or she presented there. But uh, yeah, they, they, they're interesting points, both her talk and Hastin Bloom's point about the value of tracking and how much is being missed by the fact that you go to the clinic once a year <laughs> and that's it for the doctor, whereas this provides a lot more information. Yeah, it will certainly, as I say, come on in studies, I think. I think, yeah. I don't think it's a particularly valuable thing to do. I've tried a number of times to actually do yeah. it. But when you're a carer of your, of your wife and partner, it's not Yeah, yeah, that's the burden part. I was talking about the gel a couple of weeks ago. Um, and it's not easy to do. Yeah. I think there is work that could easily be done by another to actually create an app. Right. Something with, with a much yes. easier form to fill in every day, right. hour by hour. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it would actually be well worth right. just to make it really easy to do that tracking and probably yeah. more objective by having a care partner do it mm. rather than by participating themselves or maybe yeah. both. Yeah. Because you know, that would be a few as well as yes. how they yeah. behave. Well, I would think that's, that's got to be the way forward. Mm. It's very good app that everybody can use on the smartphone. Yes. Or the yes. Right yeah, it's a great idea. I don't know if she's already doing that or I need to read more about what she's done, but yeah, it's great. Okay, should we go on? Yes. Okay, so back to a bit more of the hardcore size. I was almost surprised at this conference. There was very little about drug treatments. Because often when you talk about research for Parkinson's and where the money is, you think it's drugs. Um, and sometimes Parkinson's UK, it seems to be talked that way as if it's all about drugs. There wasn't much about drugs, but there was this one which looks very promising. And now it was selected by the conference organizers in Barcelona as a hot topic, which means it's something that's been new research fairly recent that looks to be really interesting. So it was chosen as one of those. And also Parkinson's UK, I noticed, have put it on their website as a bit in the blog written by Claire Bale quite recently about that. So it's being picked up by others as important. It's this drug called NX, L, NLX112. Um, to reduce dyskinesia is that can these, these uncontrollable movements when people take L-dopa that develop after a while of taking L-dopa. Should we go on, David? Just show you. Excuse me, sorry. Just okay. give me a moment, please. How okay. can I call you? Lucy. Lucy is Annie. Okay. I, am a, I am a carer for yeah. Lady Lillian. Okay. Um, a couple of days ago, right. uh, Lillian's uh, partner found the articles, okay. I don't know which uh, newspaper, but quite interesting. Okay. And uh, if you would like to read, uh, maybe we can, um, uh, I don't know, copy machine. machine okay, your own. I'll tell you what, is I'll need to have a look at this and go and look up the research. That's and fine. if you let me have your contact details. Yes. And get back to you about what that is. Exactly so what you I'll see you after, everyone. so I'll have a look at that. Yes, and then, if you, yeah. yes. I don't know if it's this they're talking about, maybe a different one. There's a lot of studies going Thank on. you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So this drug, it's one of these drugs that was originally used for something else and is being repurposed. So that has the advantage that some initial safety work's been done. Um, now, this drug, it's highly selective for, let's say it's 5-HT1A receptors. Now, so 5-HT is a neurotransmitter. It's quite like dopamine. It is the same sort of small molecule, but it's a different neurotransmitter. And it's been known for some while that it's somehow involved in the dyskinesias that happens. Something to do with the balance between dopamine and 5-HT. Um, somehow why some individuals develop these dyskinesias and others don't. Something to do probably with the 5-HT. Anyway, this, this drug has been tested uh, to see if it reduced dyskinesias. And the results were really good. Um, this was done in Sweden. Uh, five centers in Sweden, and it was a very small scale study. If we go on, David, to the next one. So they really, they were just at the initial stages of looking, is it safe and is it tolerable? Uh, so it was only 15 people with Parkinson's compared with seven given a placebo drug um, over eight weeks. So it's fairly sh short term here, 
but they found very good results, even with a small number of people like that. Um, that it certainly it reduced the dyskinesias in those people. These people have been selected for this trial because they had problematic dyskinesias. And what's really remarkable, um, it also improved Parkinson's, reduced the Parkinson's scores. It seemed to be improving in other ways. Now this was reported in the talk by Adrian who gave the talk. It's not actually in the news release below. So this drug looks to be possibly more exciting than just dyskinesias, helping dyskinesias. So this talk, short talk, but it was, it was certainly saying this is what's really promising and they're going on to larger trials about this. I just want to mention, this is the drug that Will Powell was talking about and is investigating. Will who gave the talk here last October. So the pharmacology group at University of Hertfordshire, Mammoth's group, are working with this drug and it looks to be really interesting. We've reported, I say we, we've popped in there as well, um, anti-anxiety effects with this drug. This is in animal models. But we know that 5-HT is involved in anxiety. That would be useful for Parkinson's treatments. Uh, it may also protect neurons. So this is work, and actually will present it in the poster at Barcelona on that. So I was partly selected this because I'm interested in this because of the work going on at Hertfordshire and Will's working with this Neuralixis company. But I'm talking about this here because of this clinical trial that looked very positive. Are there any thoughts or comments on that? How long do you think it would be before it's available to be taken? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this, this, when it says phase 2B trial, they'll have to have a lot more people and it'll have to be over a lot longer period. So we're talking two or three or four years before you get the results of that. And then you'd want to go to a phase three, lots and lots of people in different centres and so on. So sort of years ago, you'd hope now things could be fast tracked, maybe. But yeah, and it always takes so long. Yeah. Okay, let, let's move on. David. Okay, that's enough of the science, the research. <laughs> so this was a wonderful session towards the end of the conference. Um, a sort of a special presentation by Paul Mayhew Archer. Come across him, he's a comedian. Um, he was involved, he was a script writer for The Vicar of Diddley. And he's also worked with Richard Curtis, the filmmaker who made Love Actually and Notting Hill and the Four Weddings and the Funeral. So he's a yeah, expert, comedy writer who has Parkinson's. Um, he's now doing the, in that podcast, have you come across this, the Movers and Shakers podcast with Jeremy Paxman and the, these other people, Mark Waddell and so on. So there he is on the left with two of the other members of the, the Movers and Shakers podcast, Rory Kethan Jones and Gillian Lacey Sonmar. They were at the conference. Uh, but Paul did a fantastic session. Um, it was actually well oversubscribed. They had to move us into a bigger room to do it. And he was just fantastic on the comedy. So it's advertised there. Uh, this is the advertising for it in, in the conference booklet there. Uh, in 2010, comedy writer May U. Archer was told he had Parkinson's and decided to find it funny. If you're worried or in need of a laugh, come along, this might just be the session you needed. And it was really a great way to end the session. I noticed that they did record a session from the conference podcast and that is available now. I just listened to it yesterday actually come up. So there is a special Moves and Shakers on tour in Barcelona podcast. So they're also talking about their experiences of the conference. They're talking about completely different things than I've chosen. So there's more to listen about. Yeah. Okay, shall we go on there? Yeah, so that's sort of come to the end of the sort of main content I'm talking about here. Just I wanted to finish by just saying the interest in research and okay, you all are because you're here. That's great. Um, ways to keep in touch with what's going on research. Um, there are lots of good research talks online, particularly remember um, recommend the no silver bullet for PD. If you've come across that. Um, these are excellent talks, so experts in the field come and give these talks. You listen to them live, or they are recorded on YouTube. Cure Parkinson's and Michael J. Fox also have webinars, talks by experts. So if you're getting them from these reliable sources, those are really good places, I think, to find out about recent research, because it seems to me they select the interesting good people there to talk about. Should we go on here? Um, you can join the research support network at Parkinson's UK, it's the website there. And you're part of this network where you get emails and sort of information on there. Shall we go on? 
So now within that, there's the research interest group Brig East. Some of you may be members, I'm a member at the minute, Ruth Herman got me into it, so Ruth's a member. Um, this is more sort of more local, although it is Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire, Essex, Suffolk, Norfolk, Cambridgeshire, which is great, we get Cambridge people, um, to have meetings there and hopefully events and, and doing things. So that, and I think we could do with more members, if you're interested, input to that. Should we go on? Uh, oh yeah, really local, that's me, of course, if you're a research junkie. I do occasionally have been doing uh, reading groups. I hope to do one perhaps in September on the biomarker article, I think. Um, I've been doing them online, but I can do them, I hope to do some more in-person ones. So do let me know if you'd like to do that. It's a group of six or eight of us sitting around the table going through an article in some detail. So it'd be a bit like the biomarker one. But I'm open to suggestions for topics. I go up and look at that one. Shall we go on? Um, yes. So it's not just you learning about research, but it's you actually inputting to what research is done. This is really important for you to shape research. You know, it's your decisions on where the money is spent. And you do that by volunteering through Parkinson's UK uh, to be a lay grant reviewer. I'm guessing Janet have done some of this. You've certainly been involved in the, the PPI one, haven't you? Um, patient public involvement contributor. So this is where you are sort of teamed up with a researcher or a group of researchers early on as they're planning their research and you input to how they design their research study and how they do that. So this is really important for uh, getting research done that's appropriate and do it in a good way, you know, that works for people like yourself, people with Parkinson's. Uh, so very important. And all researchers will be keen to hear from you because Parkinson's UK make sure researchers do this now. So we do have to do that. So there we go. Thank you. That's my suggestions for that. Oh, of course, actually being a volunteer. We said like the, the being part of that cohort. There's lots of opportunities. Best place to look probably on the Parkinson's UK website. You can sign up. It says give you your address, so it gives you local things. But actually, an awful lot of research is online now or by post. Um, so it's worth having a look and take part in things. We really do need you to take part. And it's great to hear stories from those of you who are taking part in studies. So there we go, I think that's it. I think that's me. The next slide is, is just, oh, if we go on, it's just me saying thank you. And uh, great to have questions if we've gone along, but if there are any more questions now, I'm happy to get some more questions. Or any discussion points? What's to think about, I think, in that? Is there any research into the negative effects of dopamine along the intake? It was just regulation. Yes, yes. Um, it, it's certain types of um, dopamine treatments, not always, not all of them do the same, but certain of the dopamine agonists, and there's risk of things like gambling behaviours and so on, that's regulation. Yes, so I, I know that's going on. Um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I'd have to go and look up about it, what's the current research, but yes. You know, if there's anything that they're doing to tweak the drug so that it doesn't have this effect. Okay, I don't know the details of that, but it may well be going on, yeah. yeah. Okay, but certainly exactly as research champion, I can go and then try and look that up and find out more for you. Yeah. Any others? No. Great, okay. Well, thank you all. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Lucy. Very Great, much. thank you all for listening. <laughs> thank you very much for coming along and giving your time, spending a lot of time. Spending a lot of time just uh, preparing that for us. So it's, uh, well, I need to make sure I understood it. So. <laughs> Helps me. <laughs> yeah. no, thank you very much. Okay. And um, yeah, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoyed that. Next month we've got something very different. We've got on good recommendation we have a man called Alistair Elliott coming along with, uh, and he's going to do he's doing some work with sounds and rhythms. Hello. And he's found uh, he's also involved with sub lines oh, right. as yes. well. I think in the US market, but he's found that. Um, with uh, working with drums and bombs that can actually help ease some of the uh, um, the anxiety and restlessness that can be associated with Parkinson's. So he's going to come and tell us some of his stories uh, and things he's been doing and also bring along some drums and gongs so that we can have 